1995, about 10 days after I graduated high school. And I'm sitting on the couch, watching TV with my girlfriend, thought it'd be funny to make the world's largest beanbag. It just popped in my head. No other rhyme or reason. Uh, very impulsive kid. Actually got off the couch, got in the car, drove down to the fabric store, bought 14 yards of uh, this black and also tan pleather that was on sale on the sale table. Uh, took it home, laid it out on the floor, um, found a baseball, thought there's a cool way to make a, a sphere. Uh, cut out two giant figure eight patterns and uh, took them to actually my girlfriend's mom uh, who sewed them up into a giant uh, baseball. Uh, this thing was meant to be a giant beanbag. So I went down, I bought uh, a few bags of beanbag beads at the local you know, craft store, dumped them into this thing, and it didn't even, didn't even make a dent. Okay, so I knew I was going to have to come up with a better solution. I uh, <clears throat> looked around the house, I found those packing peanuts, you know, broke those up into little pieces, uh, chopped up some old blankets that we had, and it still was just nothing. So... I looked in the closet, found my mom's, you know, camping mattresses, you know, those yellow foam kind of mattresses that you take camping or rolled up with a bungee cord, took those down to the basement and chopped them up on a paper cutter, you know, using one of those things that you chop paper with, like in school. And uh, it took me about uh, three weeks to chop up enough of that foam to fill this thing. And when I was done, uh, I had this seven foot sack, like the, the kind of like this one I'm sitting next to, only uh, even bigger. And uh, you could say that was the first love sack. Of course, at the time, it wasn't called a love sack. It was just this thing that I had made. And um, it's made out of vinyl, uh, black and tan. And we'd take it to the beach and sleep on it. We'd take it to the drive-in movies. And people would be like, man, where'd you get that thing? I want one of those. I'd be like, look, it took me three weeks to make it. <laughs> I'm never <laughs> making another one again. And uh, actually wrapped it up in plastic and put it away uh, in the shed for two years because at age 19, I went off and became a missionary for my church. I flew to Taiwan. I was a missionary for the Mormon church. I spent two years learning Chinese, speaking Chinese, and teaching people about our uh, religion. When I came back two years later, I'm now 21 years old, completely forgot about this uh, sack and uh, began dating again and, and going out with my friends uh, in college at the University of Utah studying business and also Chinese. And uh, one night we were going to the drive-in movies and I remembered we had this, I had this thing and it was, um, it was in my house, uh, it was back in the shed. And so um, I grabbed my next door neighbor who at the time was Dave Underwood, later became my business partner. Didn't even know the guy, he was fixing his Jeep, said, hey man, I need your help. He helped me open the shed, pull this thing out and uh, we took it to the drive-in movies. And um, once again, everybody wanted one. So time went by, and um, I was actually uh, working, paying my way through school as a cell phone salesman at a kiosk. And my neighbors just kept bugging me. Every time they saw this thing, they're like, we want one. Please make one for our kids. We want one for our family. So finally, kind of a, 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 you know, half a year went by, and I said, okay, okay, if I make you one, um, I'm going to sell it to you. And so therefore, um, I should start a company, right, to sell it to you. That would be kind of a funny thing to do. And so I was sitting there at my cell phone kiosk, um, bored out of my mind, paying my way through school and thinking of names. And I just needed, you know, a hippie beanbag, 70s, love, peace, hate, war, bag, love, bag, love, sack. Oh, that's cool. Uh, went down to the Utah State Tax Commission, paid $25. Uh, and on October 31st, 1998, registered the name Love Sack in the state of Utah. That was the beginning of the company. Um, made the sack for my neighbors. I found uh, this furniture company who manufactured sofas uh, in the Yellow Pages. And I went down there and said, hey, when you make your sofas, do you have any scrap foam left over? Um, they said, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, in fact, we, we sell it back to the foam manufacturer. Sometimes we throw it away. I said, well, let me buy that foam from you. And I take it home every, every day in the back of my um, Ford Bronco and Chop these, chop these pieces of foam up into little pieces and put them in these sacks. Anyways, it was, it was slow and painful. And after about my fifth visit down there, taking these big bags of foam home, I said, you know, do you guys know of any way to chop this stuff up? And they started laughing and said, oh yeah, we've got a, a foam shredder right back here. So uh, they started letting me use their foam shredder just because they, they thought it was kind of funny. And uh, 
this thing was, was basically, it was a converted farm implement. It was a little grain grinder, which is kind of like a lawnmower. And uh, it ran off an electric motor. And um, basically, I had to take these big pieces of foam, whatever size they were, chop them into smaller pieces using a kitchen knife, and then shove them into this mouth and step back as this thing rattled around. And it would shred up foam and spit it out of this tube. And now I could stuff a sack in like an hour. And so all of a sudden, uh, I could make sacks. And uh, in fact, as we started displaying them, at like the college May Fest, October Fest, you know, various festivals around town, we started taking orders and it got pretty busy. And so I brought a couple friends on. We ran the business through college just kind of as a joke. It was kind of like a, a funny thing to do while we were, you know, preparing for our real jobs. Um, the company grew a little bit. We made a, you know, a few hundred sacks, maybe a year, um, if that. So Red Bull Energy Drink had ordered 50 sacks in, in you know, silver and blue. And uh, before I left for China, they were still working on them when I got home. They were piled up in my parents' basement, ready to shrink down and ship out. And so I got home. I helped them uh, finish that order that we had begun before I left for China a year ago. And Love Sack um, continued to just kind of stumble forward. I said, look, you guys, I've got this job lined up in China. I just have to finish my degree this last semester, spring 2001. I'm going to move back, take this job, and, and get on with my life. So we've, I think, got to close Love Sack down. And everyone who had a love sack just couldn't believe it. They're like, no, you can't close love sack. I love my love sack. So um, I decided to give it one last shot to kind of prove to the world that, you know, this, this could never be a real company. And uh, we went to this trade show in Chicago in the spring of 2001 for promotional products. Like you could put your logo on our sack and you could have the Red Bull sack or the Coca-Cola sack or whatever. And lots of companies loved it. They thought it was cool. They thought it was huge and crazy. But... Um, no one bought anything. So um, we, we returned home and I was wrapping up a few last you know, customer's orders down there at our factory and shredding up foam and covered in foam one day, little foam pieces everywhere in my face. And my phone rings in my pocket. I pull it out, it's my mobile phone. And, and, uh, and, it's, and I answer the phone, you know, Love Sack headquarters. And it, uh, it turns out that it's the Limited 2. And the Limited 2 is a little, you know, little girl's store in the mall and they wanted... 12,000 little love sacks uh, for Christmas. And they had no idea that it was like me and a lawnmower and a couple friends uh, making this happen. So I said, you know, oh yeah, of course, no problem. You know, we're love sack. We're the, we're the best not beanbag company in the world. And uh, they said, look, we need them in five months. They have to be in this blue and purple sparkly fabric. Uh, and they sent me a little piece in the mail, and um, we need them for this really, really low price. I said, no problem. You know, we're the, we're the best in the world. And uh, anyway, um, I, I found this fabric uh, in the mail, and I flew off to North Carolina the, to the nation's biggest fabric show to find it. And I walked this whole show. And it was a massive uh, fabric exhibition. Could not find it. Finally, on the bottom floor in the corner, there it was, you know, like, ah, like bolt from heaven, this roll of a purple fuzzy fabric for the limited two. I went up to the guy and said, look, I need to buy 30,000 yards of this fabric for this order. And the guy said, no problem. You know, it's, it's five bucks a yard or something like that. And I said, oh man, you know, I've run the numbers. Their price is so low. I'm going to need this fabric way cheaper. I don't know how I'm going to, you know, afford that. And so I was about to give up again thinking, I don't know what I'm even doing here. I don't even have the money to buy 30,000 yards of fabric. My parents have, you know, don't, don't have that kind of money or anything. And so I'm about to leave the show and I'm looking around this guy's booth and he's got all of these cardboard boxes with Chinese writing on them. And uh, I, you know, I, I can read Chinese. So I read it and it turns out it's the address of the fabric mill in China that makes this fabric. So I thought, can't quit now, right? So um, I, I, I leave the show, I get on a plane, I fly back to my old stomping grounds of Shanghai, China. I uh, walk into that fabric mill up on the 31st floor of this uh, building in downtown Shanghai. I said, hi, I'm Sean. I'm here for the limited two and I need uh, 30,000 yards of this stuff. And they said, oh, you know, no problem. Uh, that'll be, you know, five bucks a yard or something. And, and I basically, I, I said all that in English, by the way, because I was so nervous at, uh, you know, 23 years old to be doing business over, overseas. And uh, immediately in front of me, they actually started talking about how much it costs to really make this fabric. Not, of course, thinking that I, I spoke Chinese. 
And so uh, I knew that they could make it from my price if, if, they, if they would. So I just sat there. For three days, I negotiated and said, I need it cheaper, I need it cheaper. Finally, after three days, I said, okay, 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 we do the deal. And, um, and uh, you know, we make no money. And, and I, I knew that they were telling the truth. And so I took them up on the deal and I enlisted these guys to make me 12,000 little love sacks um, cut and sewn and shipped to me on a container where I would receive them in America and uh, shred up the foam and stuff them and, and get them ready for the limited tour. So now, spring of, of 2001, um, before I left China, they said, okay, only one problem, we need a, we need a deposit to begin the order and uh, we'll need like $60,000. I said, no problem, you know, we're love sack. I went back to my hotel room, a little panicked. I called up the limited two and I said, all right, my factory's ready to go. I just need $60,000 in order to get this uh, deal started. And they said, uh, well, you know, we're the limited. We don't, we don't give deposits. And I said, well, we're love sack. I'm, I've, n- I've never done a deal without a deposit. What's wrong with you? And they said, uh, finally, after, you know, going back and forth, okay, okay. They wired me $60,000 to my only bank account at the time which uh, was the University of Utah Credit Union Love Sack account. I promptly wired all that money to China and got them going on the order. And uh, then I flew back home, having spent the limited's money, uh, penniless, needing to build a foam shredding and stuffing factory. So uh, I sent out every credit card offer that I could find. And back in 2001, at 23 years old, uh, there were many uh, credit facilities willing to give me um, willing to give me a chance so I got back a you know a handful of credit cards I went out and maxed them all out I bought the wood to build the tables I got a cash advance to pay my first month's rent on this 20,000 square foot old decrepit warehouse that was built in the 18 in fact in fact it was so old that this wood floor when we finally got a forklift in there to lift these uh, 2,000 pound bales of foam we would buy uh, the forklift fell through the floor with, with me on it that's how old this place was. It was, it was. it was a lesson in inefficiency. But we built the factory. We bought uh, you know, 50,000 pounds of foam ready to shred up. And we did basically all this on credit cards. I went to buy a bunch of those little grain grinder shredders out in the farm towns of, of Utah. And uh, after coming to the conclusion that they're kind of dangerous and uh, pretty slow, I asked the farmer if he had anything bigger. And he said, oh yeah. And he showed me this eight foot tall uh, machine that's used on a farm called a hay buster, which is actually like a giant KitchenAid mixer with huge blades in the bottom. And the catch is this thing is actually powered by a tractor. So I credit carded this old machine uh, that was a 1979 hay buster, probably a hundred grand new, but $10,000, you know, 30 years later. And uh, I got an agricultural loan from the U.S. government to buy the John Deere tractor that would power this thing. Got them down to downtown Salt Lake City outside of our warehouse. Uh, Got some guy who was building the street at the time to push all the dirt from three blocks in front of our dock high, uh, you know, garage door at this warehouse. And we parked this tractor up on this dirt mound. We got the hay buster inside the building. The tractor had to stay outside because, you know, it ran on diesel fuel and would, would blow smoke like a tractor will. We connected the two through the door with a drive line every day fired the thing up at 5 a.m., and we were shredding foam. So every day of my life, uh, for two months, I would show up at 5 a.m. to the factory with five cans of diesel fuel, stand on the front tire of this tractor. By 5.30, I'm now covered in diesel fuel. Uh, take a half hour to get the thing started in, cold, in these cold September mornings of 2001. And um, basically, me and my 20 uh, temp laborers would work side by side, stuffing sacks, shredding foam, and stuffing sacks all day long. So by the middle of October 2001, we had completed the order for the limited two. 12,000 sacks out the door on trucks, shrunken down in cute little tiny boxes for the limited two. And uh, we didn't have much to celebrate. It was so inefficient running that factory for our first time, we didn't make a dime. Uh, we, I, I was now 24 years old, 55 grand in credit card debt, I owned a hay buster, a tractor, a forklift, a sack factory, and I didn't have one customer because I had been in there making sacks the entire time. So we ran out, we went to the furniture stores near ta- in, nearby and even in states neighboring us, and we said, look how cool these are. They come shrunken down. They're huge. They're comfy. The covers come off. And uh, 
everyone just laughed at us. These furniture experts, right, said they're too big, they're too heavy, they're too expensive. Nobody's going to want your logo in their house. It's not going to work. So we decided to open our own stores. This time we maxed out my cousin's credit cards. Uh, I had nothing left and, and he, was, uh, he was a, a daring entrepreneur and uh, said, we can do this. We opened the first love sex store on November 17th in 2001 at the Gateway Mall in Salt Lake City, Utah. Neon sign, carpet paint, posters, tried to make it look professional. And uh, sure enough, um, we had, uh, we, you know, we were worried that people would just laugh at us. I mean, we, you know, we were next to Abercrombie and The Gap, and then here's uh, Love Sack selling these things that no one had ever seen before. And we were hoping to just sell one super sack a day, and we could probably pay the rent that way and, and maybe slowly chip away at our debt and even maybe pay ourselves five bucks an hour, which would have been the first time any Love Sack employee really had ever been paid in, uh, in four years. So, um, we opened this store and 10 days into it, hoping we'd sell anything, we had people coming in saying, oh, this is so cool, you know, who do I talk to about a franchise? And uh, my cousin who was working the store with me ran up and gave him my card and said, oh, call this guy, he's the head guy, you know, he'll tell you all about it. So I saw this happen, I ran outside uh, the mall store, answered my, my cell phone, said, you know, love sack. And um, he said, oh, do you guys franchise? I said, of course we franchise. And, uh, and sure enough, um, about a month later, we had sold our first franchise. I said, what, what store are you in? And, and he said, oh, I'm in your Salt Lake location. I said, oh, yeah, that's a great one. And uh, anyway, we, we ended up selling a franchise and then more franchises, and we grew that way. And um, it was actually a really fun time. We opened tons of stores selling just sacks. And a funny thing happened. In all of our stores, we had these sacks set up in front of a leather sofa that looked a lot like this new leather sectionals that I'm sitting on right here, in fact. And in the corner of the store, people kept saying, um, you know, the sack's awesome, I bought it, but how much for the, for the couch? And I, you know, we actually sold it once and we scratched it trying to carry it out of the store and then I had to borrow my friend's truck to deliver it. It was a mess. And then when we got it to the guy's house, he said, well, I want to buy the matching armchair. <laughs> You know, that couch was just for display. So we spent three years trying to figure out how to put a sofa in a box, shrink it down like we do the love sacks. And uh, after much uh, trial and error, we uh, stumbled onto sectionals. We now hold four patents on sectionals with another one pending, um, where with only two pieces, the side, which I'm sitting on, and the base, which is the seat and the back pillow together, um, you can build anything you want. And uh, we now can sell you that couch in the corner and we can turn it into a sectional or an armchair or an ottoman or a movie lounge or anything you can imagine. And you can even take the covers off, uh, wash them in the washing machine for the most part, unless they're leather like this one. And you know, sectionals are the future of Love Sack. The sacks are our heritage and we love them and they continue to be the biggest, baddest thing on the planet. But sectionals is something that every home needs and that uh, there's a style or a cover or even a size to fit anyone. And so I believe that uh, this is a billion dollar product. And I believe that this um, sort of accidental company that we stumbled onto um, will uh, turn into something great for the world as Love Sack is meant to be. Uh, we believe in our name. We believe in the love that it exudes, and we are very grateful to you, our customers and friends who have supported us for years and years that we, as we stumbled through our days of franchising and had to start over and, and rebuild the company and grow again. Uh, and uh, I don't know what we're gonna do next. I know we've got big plans and lots of products in the works, and I believe that there are big things in store for this little company. Um, very grateful to you for supporting it. Shawnee D, uh, coming at you from my own home. And uh, big thanks to my friends uh, in, from college who are still with me today, some of them, and uh, our friends now at Lovesack HQ who make this thing happen. Oh, and as a side note, that uh, Chinese guy who sold me the fabric originally, who I only spoke English to, well, we still do business with him today. We've done millions and millions of dollars with him. And uh, about one day, about a year later, I took him out for dinner and, 
And after uh, the meal and uh, he was uh, relaxed, I said in, in, I think, pretty decent Chinese across the table, um, you know I speak Chinese. In fact, I speak it pretty well. And, uh, and anyway, it's been great doing business with you. <laughs> And I can see the whole, you know, last couple of years re- rewinding in his mind, you know, what things has he said in front of me that maybe he shouldn't have. So anyway, it's been a crazy ride and uh, there's more to come.